Edward Surratt's wife, Afia, gives police a tip that Edward Surratt is in possession of a car with South Carolina plates. So the Pennsylvania State Police move in to arrest their man. When confronted, Surratt runs, and now it's been one month since the last confirmed sighting of the alleged serial killer. Come down, come down the valley with me. Come down where darkness came to be. Come down, come down the story still told. The night the shotgun slayer took hold. Come down, come down the valley with me. No stranger thing has happened, you see. Come down, come down so brazen and bold. The night the shotgun slayer took hold. On the evening of July 1st in St. Augustine, Florida, a Volano Beach homeowner is outside checking on his plants when he sees a man peering through his bathroom window. In an attempt to alert his wife to the prowler, the homeowner runs inside the house, slamming the door after himself. The prowler forces his way inside the home and at gunpoint leads the family, a man, his wife and his daughter, into a bedroom. They are all tied up. While the man is on the floor, the intruder assaults and rapes the two women, all while he's consuming alcohol and marijuana. Then he falls asleep on the bed next to his victims. The man, still tied on the floor, is able to work himself free, unties himself and runs to the neighbors to call police. The suspect attempts to escape but is ultimately apprehended. He refuses to tell police his name and is held without bond. A day later, Florida authorities identify the man as Edward Arthur Surratt. Word travels quickly to law enforcement in other states. The fact that he was so clumsy in, in the crime in which he was caught suggests um, he, he just he didn't know what else to do and whatever. He just gave up. Did he want to get caught? No, they don't want to get caught. But I think he already knew in his mind he was caught because he knew they had identified him. He knew they were after him. He didn't have many resources for a real way to get away. Surratt asked to speak with his childhood friend, Wayne Lepecki, who also happens to be a public defender in Beaver County. I think we all went down together, as I recall, DAs and law enforcement officers. We all flew on the same plane, as I recall, and stayed in the same hotel. Wayne evidently was, well, clearly was my boss. And as I recall, in sometime in July of 1978, he said, uh, I would like you to go to uh, St. Augustine with me and we're going to go down there and um, interview, if you will, uh, Surratt. I was escorted over to the jail, and uh, I think the rest, uh, most of the people in law enforcement uh, sat in the hotel lobby and uh, drank, hoping that I would come out and solve their cases for them. He was happy to see me. He wanted to talk, just to talk but nothing about what had gone wrong. One of the adjectives that I would attribute to him, uh, a very bright guy. Uh, he impressed me as somebody that could sell somebody the ocean without the water. He was very confident in his demeanor, did not articulate with anger. I left with a positive impression. Uh, we were in the room alone with him. Other than, you know, transcending the fact that he's shackled and all of that, if I were interviewing him for something, uh, I would uh, use the adjective positive. It's not as if uh, he embraced, if there's such a, a caricature of a criminal, he certainly did do that. I said, you know, Ed, we're down here for a reason. He says, we've got a hotel full of law enforcement people, you're in jail, you know, a very serious matter. and. Uh, he then started to, uh, not quiet, he just didn't, he didn't want to talk about it. And as I said, do you have anything that you want to tell me about what happened up north? And he said, no, I don't want to talk about anything up there. What I try to do is I said, you have to get legal counsel here. You're, you're in Florida and you're charged with, a, charged with a very serious crimes. And we were talking about make sure you're this, don't, you know, don't say anything to anybody about any of your cases, 
you know, because that's what you tell all defendants. It's sort of gone, gone from, he was like sort of happy to see me, and then it went sort of uh, thing. But he never said anything in a mean way or bitter way. In fact, when I left, uh, he had a look on his face of uh, mournful. When I left, I said, good luck, Ed. And he said, thanks for coming, Wayne. That was it. Law enforcement from other states do not get answers to any of their questions relating to the murders Surratt has allegedly committed. Well, the reason we went down to Florida was obviously to talk to him about our cases in western Pennsylvania, both Beaver and Allegheny counties. And when we went there, we mainly wanted to talk about Renee Greger and whether or not he would tell us where she was because at the time she was still missing and we wanted to ask him some other questions about other cases. He didn't talk a whole lot, really. He didn't say, look, if you give me this, I'll, I'll tell you that. And I kept asking him questions. And while we were there, he wasn't really paying a lot of attention to us because his cell was small, but it was big enough that, or small enough, I should say, that his arms were extended out and his legs were extended out, touching the walls and doing push-ups from a four-point stance and that's what he was doing while he was talking to us. Sometimes paying attention, sometimes not. And eventually we felt it was just a waste of time and there wasn't anything more we could get from him. When he was in Florida, my goal was, it, A, we wanted to, uh, to try and get a, a confession of the murder, but there were also some other homicides that we thought in our, not in our jurisdiction, but close by, that we felt he was uh, responsible for, and one on which the female was missing and I know that Pennsylvania had some cases where females were missing, and, and I approached him on the vein of, look, you're not going anywhere here, you're gonna be in prison. How about giving these families some peace of mind and, and tell us where those bodies are? And he just, just looks at you like, I don't care. I mean, that, he in so many words just said that. It just doesn't mean anything to him. When we showed him the photographs of the crime scene photos, you would hope that you try to evoke some emotion out of a, out of a suspect. And sometimes you do. I mean, they, they will look back or don't want to look. It actually appeared to excite him. He derived pleasure from seeing that. Wayne Lepecki continues to research cases because he wants to make sure he is ready for a trial if Pennsylvania decides to prosecute Surratt. He goes to talk to Surratt's wife, Afia. Very soft-spoken lady from, I think she was from North Carolina or South Carolina. And I remember her saying, uh, I, this isn't where I should be living because Ellicopa by the late 70s there was a lot of tension going on and I remember her saying this isn't where I want to live. The only thing I can remember her saying was that he would have, and like I said he was a, an outgoing person for the most part, he said there would be spells where he would just gaze and gaze outside or gaze up and then he, he would leave the house. He would go and she didn't know where he went. At Surratt's pretrial hearing in August 1978, Surratt enters a plea of not guilty to two counts of sexual assault and one count of burglary. South Carolina begins their paperwork for Surratt's extradition so he can stand trial for the murder of Luther Langford and for the assault of Nell Langford. By September 20th, Surratt's trial for his Florida crimes begins. While on the stand, Edward Surratt claims that he was invited into the victim's home for a sex party. After only a one-day trial, the jury deliberated for two and a half hours, finding Surratt guilty on three counts of rape and one count of burglary. On October 27th, Surratt is sentenced to two life terms and two 100-year sentences for his crimes in the Volano Beach home. Beaver County Assistant District Attorney Clarence Nish and Beaver County Detective Townsend Tank Smith stay in Florida in hopes of getting Surratt to open up and give details about the killing of William Adams and the disappearance of his wife, Nancy. After all, Surratt had already confessed to the detective to the murder of John Shelkins when they interviewed him in July. However, Surratt later states to the media that his confession to the Shelkins murder was simply strategic, implying that he was attempting to get away from South Carolina, a state where his alleged crimes carried the possibility of the death penalty. South Carolina, however, gets Surratt on trial for the murder of Luther Langford and the assault of Nell Langford by June 1979. Donald Myers was the prosecuting attorney in the case. He was indicted for murder, 
assault and battery with intent to kill, burglary, armed robbery, and rape. Every case is different. None of them are exactly alike. And you got somebody who's transient, traveling through, you got to put them in the area, you got to show that they had the opportunity to commit the crime. In this case, we had a, a, a main witness who was uh, horribly beaten. It affected her entire body. That was another challenge. Back then, you didn't have DNA. That's another challenge. So, yeah, it was a lot of challenges. In order to place Surratt in the area of the killings and assault, Myers puts up several witnesses. He sold blood on uh, a good many days to get money. Uh, he stayed in a homeless shelter for a few days. So putting him in the area around the time the crime was important because he wasn't from that area. Myers and his team bring in the Pennsylvania State Police to testify that Surratt was in possession of the Langford's car. Myers also decided to put on a living witness to testify, Nell Langford. She was a very fine elderly lady, a genteel southern woman, and she went through hell. After that night, she never was the same. She was brutally beaten and raped. Oh, yeah, she was in a wheelchair, had trouble talking. For her, it was very, very difficult. She had to undergo several operations. She was in a rehabilitation place for a long time. Dealing with her was extremely difficult uh, because of what Surratt did to her. Prior to the trial, a police officer asked Nell to ID the suspect in a photo lineup. She also had to pick out the suspect again in the presence of the judge before she went in to testify in front of the jury to get these pictures blown up extremely large for her to even see. Her eyesight was greatly impaired. We had six photographs, and when she looked at him, she picked him out right off the bat. When it comes time to take the stand in front of the jury, Nell must again identify the man who attacked her and killed her husband. And when she was looking at the, the huge photographic lineup, I think she got confused on the numbers. She uh, clearly couldn't see the numbers. Anyhow, there was a lot of confusion on that. But he was in the courtroom at the time, and she said, that's the man right there that did this. So she picked him out in the courtroom. And when she did that, the defense backed off. They'd been given a rough time up until that point. Surratt is found guilty for his crimes in South Carolina, but he doesn't get the death penalty there. We had what we call a hung jury. They could not decide. Edward Surratt is returned to Florida to begin serving his lifelong prison sentence. But the answers that investigators seek to close their cases, Surratt keeps to himself. On the next episode of Notorious, the background and character of Edward Arthur Surratt are examined. How does someone become a serial killer? And why were the lives of 19 innocent people so violently taken?